Whenever I review a flashlight, I always give my honest opinion. Viewers sometimes question that, and I get it. There's a lot of fake content out there. Today, I have the Thrunite BSS V5 for review, and Thrunite is a great company, but I have some serious misgivings about this product. Keep watching for my honest review. Today we have the Thrunite BSS V5. This is a relatively small tactical light, maybe a tactical EDC, I guess I'd call it. It's a little bigger than a typically small EDC. You can see this is a Zebra Light SC64 LE. This is a uh, tiny, tiny EDC, kind of the same size as a Hank Wang D4 or similar. Uh, but you can see it's a little longer. But I, I don't think this is too bulky. If you've seen my other content, you know that I like to EDC a Olight Warrior 3S, which is uh, pretty large, but I, I still don't mind it. So this is a small light, and it is definitely tactically minded. The way it's designed is probably for people that EDC weapons or think that they're going to get into a scrape. Let's take a look at what's inside the box quickly, which is a manual charging cable, which is USB-C to A. We have a clip that's press on. We've got a Velcro pouch, which has a loop in the back. We've got a lanyard and we got a little red filter that goes on the front of the light. More about that later. And then of course the forbidden candy. All right, let's talk about the build quality and ergonomics. So this is a pretty nice looking light and through night does a good job of building flashlights. The anodization is always really good. I like the shape of it. Uh, it's, it feels good in my hand. It's grippy, but not, uh, you know, awkward. And it's got this guarded tail switch here with a really pronounced button that's easy to access from multiple angles, but guarded so that it'll prevent accidental activation. The only things I felt compelled to say about the design of this light was two major gripes. And one is the strike bezel. The strike bezel is clearly made out of aluminum. You can tell by how lightweight it is in your hand, as well as the fact that it's not sticking to magnets. And that's a really poor choice. I mean, I don't like aluminum bezels in general because you drop your light, they hit the ground, they deform immediately, the glass cracks. Stainless steel is just such a better choice. But for a strike bezel to be aluminum, it's it's a pretty large oversight. I mean, you're supposed to strike things with it, right? So that's one thing. But then the other thing is really referenced to the theming of the light, the logo and the name. Let me explain this the way that it actually happened to me. And that is, Through Night Rep asked me if I wanted to review the BSS V5 light. And I didn't even know what BSS was. So I said, sure, yeah, send it out. We'll take a look. So I get the light and I go, what is this logo? And I'm looking at this logo going, wait, is that... Is that a Native American? Is that an arrowhead? This is kind of like awkward or maybe borderline distasteful for a Chinese company to be putting such imagery on a flashlight. So I uh, mentioned that out loud to a colleague of mine and he said, oh no, no, that's the logo for the BSS YouTube channel. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. So that's a gripe of mine because I mean, if I'm carrying a flashlight, I don't know that I want to be linked to some other person's content. And so I just think that, you know, anyone buying this light, if you didn't, if you already knew that, if you knew who BSS was and you're buying this flashlight because you love that channel, well, then that's not an issue for you. But I think there's a lot of people that, like me, didn't know what BSS stood for and didn't understand this whole tie-in. So for me, that's a detractor. I would never carry a flashlight that had a YouTube channel's branding on it. Let's take a look at the battery and the charging. It comes with a battery and it's a really nice one. It's a 3100 milliamp hour 18650. Through Night is known to use high quality cells. So I'm sure that this actually is its stated capacity. Now, when you put it in the light here, on the back side from where the power button is, is a floppy doodle. And the floppy doodle is a nice one that can rotate out of the way. So when you're charging, it's not getting stuck in the way. And this is a USB-C port, like I mentioned previously. 
while charging, this light will be red to indicate that it is charging and it turns blue once you're fully charged. Let's talk about the UI. Now I find the UI kind of a mixed bag of things that I like and things that I really don't like. So first off, let's just say that it's a side E switch with a forward clicky mechanical switch in the back. So most modes are operated by the E switch on the side and it's one click for on and one click for off, which is great. I don't like hold for on or hold for off. That's kind of annoying. But when you do turn it on, then the actual modes are just press and hold and it cycles between low, medium, high, back to low, medium, high. Now, if you want to go to turbo, it's two clicks and you go to turbo, one click exits turbo by turning it off. Sometimes one click will go back to the mode group. In this case, it turns it off. I, I have no real feeling on that. That's fine. And there is also a hidden moonlight. And that's if it's off, you press and hold, you get to a moonlight you can barely see on my hand there. So that's a great UI. And ThruNight uses that type of UI in a lot of their lights. And I love it. Now, the back switch is cool because it is a direct to turbo access button. You just press it and you're directly on turbo, so no double clicking over here. It's also a forward clicky, which means you can half press and get a momentary turbo blast. So that's good for signaling or just looking at something temporarily and then letting go. But if you latch it, it will stay on. So I love this dual interface, that's awesome. Now, the lockout. The lockout is really cool too, and there's a really advanced lockout I haven't seen in other lights before. That is, if you press and hold from off to get it into moonlight, and then press and hold again, it will now be in lockout, and that's evidenced by the fact that if I hit the button, it flashes red. I think you can see that there. You can see that it's red for a second. So that signifies that it's on lockout mode. Now, what's interesting is, if you put a light in lockout mode, obviously that's to prevent accidental activation in your bag or something. And it's conceivable that maybe something in your bag presses against this button long enough to actually pull it out of lockout. And if that were to happen, then what would happen? Well, you'd go back to moonlight. So that's actually pretty safe because moonlight can run for days. But what I thought was really cool, let me put it back into lockout here, is this, it's got a double lockout feature. While I'm in lockout right here, if I then click the tail switch and latch it, you can see that the emitter here, this little LED indicator is red constantly. This is double lockout and nothing I do over here will register. No long presses, no short clicks, nothing. So then I have to unlatch this and then a long press over here will go back to moonlight one click for off, and then one click will get us back into the regular modes. So that's a really cool feature, and I love it. Now, this is why I find the UI a, a bit of a mixed bag. The button, the E button, that you're gonna do most of your actions from is actually terrible. In casual testing, you may not notice this. I actually didn't even notice until I almost was recording a few days ago, and that is if you press the button and then pull laterally a direction, you can get the button stuck 100% of the time. Here, I'll show you. So if I were to click on, right, if I push down and pull down, you can see, let's get a good focus on this, you can see that the button is stuck under the housing. Now I have to kind of push it up like this. There we go, and I got it back out. And I can do that in every angle. So push and hold that way. Now it's stuck under this side of the bezel or push and hold this side way. And you can see it's now stuck under that part of the bezel. So um, let me get this back out. There we go. Okay, that is a huge problem for me. And um, I don't think it's just my sample. I mean, I don't see anything wrong with mine, but I should clarify that perhaps mine is a factory defect. It just doesn't seem like it. It seems like it's a poor design. I don't really know, but I want to let you know about that. The emitter that's used in here is an SST70. And yeah, it's a very high output emitter. So I give them kudos for that. But the look of it, the tint 
is atrocious. It is by far the greenest emitter I've ever seen. So let's take a look at that really quickly. I'm not even going to turn off my video lights. The video lights are actually going to help this test because the emitter is so green that any white light coming from my video lights is actually going to help it. But let's go ahead and turn it on and get a reading here. And you'll see that even at a high mode, I'm 124 points above Delta UV or BBL. That's a really green light. And it gets worse at low modes. So if I have it in one of the lower modes, you can see that I'm at about 200 points above Delta UV. And honestly, when the video lights are off, this was even higher. This was a 200 plus. So it's an extremely green light. I imagine you could tell on my hand right now. Wait till you see some beam shots on the wall. It's really actually quite gross. Now, when I put it on turbo, it does whiten up a bit, but I wouldn't call it white. This thing is still 100 points above Delta UV. So even on its best mode, turbo, which has the cleanest color, it's still very green. And I didn't even mention the fact that it's 6,000K and low CRI. So some people like cool white, so that's just kind of an opinion thing, but low CRI isn't helping anybody. And with tint this awful, I just don't see the reason this emitter was selected. All right, let's show you just how green this emitter is by doing some white wall hunting. This is a zebra light with an LH351D Samsung emitter. So this is going to be slightly above BBL, but I have my exposure locked. I have my white balance locked at daylight and it looks fairly neutral and it's, it's about 30 points above BBL. Here is a high end custom I have with a very rosy emitter and you should now see the difference between the two. So I'm going to hold these right here and let's now add on the left here the BSS and we'll see how green it really is. There you go. That really tells the tale of the tape. You can see that when it makes LH351D in the middle look rosy, that is a problem. So very green. All right, let's take a look at the lumen output. I'll cover the tube for a second so you can see it is indeed at zero. I'll press and hold on the flashlight to get into Firefly mode and let's see what we get. Let me cup this to make sure there's no stray light and you can see that Firefly mode is about half a lumen. That's pretty good for a Firefly mode. I, I think anything under two lumens is considered a pretty good moonlight. I prefer under a lumen and this is that. Now let's go ahead and turn it on. And low is getting us 37 and a half lumens, which is actually over the 29 that they quote. If we press and hold to go to medium, we're getting 350 lumens, which they quoted 355. So I'm right on the money. Let's go to high and we're getting 1350 lumens and they quote it as 1400 lumens. So that's very close. Now I'm going to turn the light off for a second and let's do our turbo test. The manual states that the flashlight is 2,676 lumens. So I just topped off the battery to make sure it's full. Let's go ahead and turn it on and I'll double tap to turbo. Let's do an ANSI runtime test. So we're gonna look at what it starts at and then what it ends at 30 seconds later. So let's go ahead and double tap right now, double tap. And we're getting 2,300 lumens at the start. But you can see it's quickly dropping. We're not even 10 seconds in. We're already to 2,000 lumens. Here we are at 15 seconds. We're at 1,900. And it's getting quite hot, actually. Wow, it's really hot. And here is ANSI, 1,700 lumens. Holy crud. That is really hot right here around the bezel. It was getting at the end there to where uh, where I was holding it on the grip of the light, I could feel it kind of uh, burning a little bit, the uh, finger right there. So this light is, um, I, I would say that's questionable performance, honestly, uh, to drop that fast and then get that hot. But maybe that's just a function of having this many lumens in this small of a light. 
I wanted to take a moment and talk about the inclusion of the deep red filter that comes with the BSS. My assumption here, and I'm just assuming based on what I know deep red light is mostly used for, is it's for preserving night vision. Now, I have kind of a problem with the idea of converting a white light into deep red for night vision preservation because it tends to be kind of orangey and not nearly as selective as you need it to be. It turns out, and I don't want to go on and on about this, but for your rhodopsin to not be depleted in your eye to preserve night vision, the red has to be about 650 nanometers or longer. And with a filter like this, you're getting some 620s and some 630s, so it's just not going to be effective the way you want it to be. So let's go ahead and take a look also at the red filter that the BSS V5 comes with. And I'm going to compare it against an actual red emitter in this jet beam. It's an SST20 deep red. So that's a 660 nanometer red emitter. And you'll notice when I turn this on here that the emitter is kind of orangey actually. So this is the BSS right here and it's kind of orangey. Let me go ahead and turn on the deep red of the SST20 and you can see, let me get them about the same, same intensity and you can see how much redder, how much truly redder the SST20 on the left is here compared to this orangey mess on the right. And that's really just a function of trying to use a filter that's not anything against the implementation. It's just a actual emitter designed to do red is always going to do better than filtered white light. Obviously, you can see that the filter has also created a ton of artifacts and rings. Now, you would notice this if you're white wall hunting like I am right now. Outside in the wild, you probably wouldn't. Okay, we're outside to get some beam shots, and I've got three flashlights. I got a Zebra Light SC64 CLE. This has the LH351D Samsung emitter at 4000K in it. That's just as a baseline. But then, really, I want to take a look at these two. These are both through night, but we've got the TN12 on the left here, the TN12 Pro, with SFT40, which I love this light. This is my still my favorite pocket thrower ever. And then we've got the BSS V5 over here, and this has the SST70, which I'm not a fan of this emitter. I love the SFT40 so much more. So let's take a look. I want to remind you that we have our white balance locked at 5000K and that our exposure is locked as well. This tree right here is 20 meters away. Then over here, not this tree, but this further tree, the one I got my finger on, this is 55 meters. And then in the back, we've got four palm trees in a row. Those are 150 meters. Let's start out on turbo with the zebra light. So there you can see how it looks on that one. It does make that further tree at 55 meters, that one right there. And then I don't see it making those palm trees in the back. It doesn't seem to. Now let's take a look at these two guys. And I'm gonna keep the TN12 Pro on the left side of frame. And I'm gonna keep the BSS V5 on the right. Let's go straight to turbo. And the first thing we should look at is the hot spot on the ground. You can see that it's more concentrated with the TN12 Pro, and it's more floody with the BSS V5. Now let's look on this tree here. You can see the difference. Let's go this further tree at 55 meters. That's the TN12 Pro, and here's the BSS V5. And now let's go to 150 meters at the back there. So that's the TN12 Pro and the BSS V5. And you can see how much cooler and cleaner the TN12 Pro emitter is versus the greenish SST70. I also thought you might like to see it with the red filter on, and I'll compare it against this JetBeam RRT01 rotary, which has been modified with a luminous SST20 deep red emitter in it. Now I've got a DC fix over the lens here just to kind of make it floodier because that's one I wanted for this light. But let's take a look at the difference between 
the filtered red. And we're on turbo now, and you can see how much it knocks down the light by putting a filter like that in front. It really just changes the output dramatically. And you can see how orangey it kind of is. And then also, if I go this way, you can start seeing these rings over here a little bit. It's kind of ringy. All right, now let's take a look at the deep red. And you can see that even though this is a smaller light and it has less output, how much more light is getting through because it's a natively red emitter. It's not passing through that filter. All right, final thoughts on the Thru-Night BSS V5. It's a good flashlight that has some serious shortcomings. Namely, the fact that the emitter is very green, and since this is a flashlight, and the whole purpose is to put out light, the quality of the light matters, and this is some of the worst light I've seen in a flashlight recently. Also, I do give it a ding for being branded at all. I love Thru-Night as a brand. I don't necessarily want to be associated with this flashlight channel. Now, if you're a BSS fan, that obviously isn't a detractor. But for anyone else, I think it probably is. Thanks for watching. And don't forget, while I still have you, that I'm running a giveaway until January 8th. So be sure that you're subscribed. Be sure that you like and comment in this video because I'm going to select a lucky winner for some free prizes on January 8th. All right, guys, see you in the next video.